and ancient medicines and also eye salve uh, for different eye diseases. So these three great industries of Laodicea play a part in this letter that is written in Revelation. Uh, Also included in this is their water supply. So it's important to know that they would have gotten their water uh, after many, many miles of traveling through aqueducts. So once Laodicea got their water, it would have been dirty, warm, and smelly. Interesting for a very wealthy city, right? So the water would have came to them lukewarm. So this this letter would have been very understandable to them because of their, their industry and their lifestyles. But this letter is a call to repentance. It's Christ saying, here I am, hear my voice, open the door. It was a call to repentance for the church. Not the unbeliever, but for those who said they believed. For a medically famous people, they neither refreshed cold water, nor healed hot water, those who were spiritually sick or wounded. Darkness had come over this church to the point where they needed called out. In fact, the way that the letter is worded, they were almost to the point of vomit in the mouth of God. So this great falling away in the church of Laodicea, a falling away from the gospel in the rock which is Jesus Christ, the very foundation himself was knocking at their door. In the book of Acts, we read about this breaking through of light into a dark world. We read about the commitment of the followers of Christ, this group of people, their sacrifice, and ultimately the piercing of darkness with a great light. Christ comes. The gospel is given. And we see the beginning of the church, the rock of the church, set upon Christ, built upon Christ. So now I want to go to one of the most mistranslated verses in all of the Bible. In fact, this mistranslation is, has given birth to one of the most deadliest religions ever. I want you to hear those words. Deadliest religions ever. It's from Matthew 16, verse 13. In fact, Pastor Kevin referred to this. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some said John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. What about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And to that answer, okay, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. One of the most mistranslated verses in all of the Bible. The stage is set at Caesarea Philippi, and uh, Jesus takes his disciples, these, these Jewish boys, to what would be known today as a red light district. There was all kinds of awful things that happened here at the base of Mount Hermon. Um, Tradition would state that when Satan was cast out of heaven, he fell at the base of Mount Hermon here. So this is where pagan idol worship takes place would take place. They would sacrifice people. They you can see in and still to this day, 
I stood there. You see these carvings in the rock where they would place these idols and worship them. You see the mouth of this cave that is literally called to this day the gates of Hades where they would throw human sacrifices in to appease the gods that they worshipped. They believed that the gates of Hades there was the entrance into the underworld. So there's As I said, uh, idol worship, there's prostitution that happens there, human sacrifice, sexual interaction, not just between humans, but between humans and animals that's taking place here, and Jesus takes the disciples. It's an interesting missions trip. Definitely a place that the Jews would have avoided Definitely a place that the disciples are probably shocked that Jesus took them to. But in Jesus' words, there's a clear challenge. He didn't want his followers hiding from evil. He wanted them to storm the gates of hell. He wanted them to plant churches in the most vile places on this earth. Because remember, it's light versus darkness. In any way that the enemy can leak in glory to something other than God, he wins. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. Many professing Christians uh, and definitely Catholics claim that the church was built upon Peter. And they quote this verse. In fact, Catholics believe and teach that this is the ordaining of the first pope, uh, which they believe to be Peter, which is kind of a staggering claim since Rome is actually who killed Peter eventually. Anyway... The name Peter here in the Greek uh, is Petros, means rock, it's a masculine form. Uh, It means rock man. And in the next phrase uh, where Jesus says, and upon this rock, he uses a different word. He doesn't use Petros again. He uses the word Petra, which is a feminine form. So he says, you, Petros, but upon this rock. Petras, I will build my church. He does not say upon you, Peter, or upon your successors, but upon this rock, upon this divine revelation that only my Father can reveal to you that I, Jesus Christ, am the Messiah. Will I build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Gates were defensive structures in the ancient world. So by saying that the gates of hell would not overcome, Jesus suggested that those gates were going to be attacked. I like that. Jesus and 12 men in the red light district declaring war. Outnumbered didn't matter. So they're standing at the literal gates of Hades, a literal gates of hell. I think the disciples may have been a little overwhelmed by the challenge, right? They'd studied under Jesus for years, and now he's commissioning them with this huge task to attack evil and to build the church on the very places where they were most filled with corruption, Jesus introduced the fact that his work of building the church was on himself, Christ alone. 1 Corinthians 3.11 makes this very clear, very clear. 
For no one can lay any foundation other than what is being laid, which is Jesus Christ. One cross-reference completely obliterates Peter being the first pope. Throughout history, though, we've seen the falling away of churches, falling away from the gospel. We've seen common men slip into self-deifying positions, causing a darkness to become even heavier upon the church. Laodicea is an example. The church at Corinth was an example. There was a movement, though, on October 1st of 1517, where one of the most famous trick-or-treaters of all time, dressed as a Roman Catholic priest, knock on the door of the Roman Catholic Church in Wittenberg, Germany, with a hammer, a nail, and a call to repentance to the Roman Catholic Church. In his paper, Martin Luther had posted 95 indictments against the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, his very first thesis called them to repentance. It said, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. See, Luther cut straight to the heart of the issue, which was the church's doctrine of redemption and grace. The Roman Catholic Church had gotten away from Scripture, which means they had gotten away from the gospel. In fact, the church had banned the reproduction and the translation of Scripture. Banned it. Putting people to death, men, women, or children, who were found to have read their Bible. They made themselves the final authority over God's word. And that remains today. They they will say that its tradition is equal to God's word, but even in that, they're putting tradition over God's word. So it's how we did it and have done it over what the Bible says. They preach that God did not offer his fellowship to be enjoyed by man through personal encounter with Christ and with God's word, but only through the ministry of priests and the sacrifices. And Martin Luther had enough. It came in one of the darkest times in history Martin Luther demanded to see the end of indulgences, which is reducing the amount of punishment one has to pay for their sin. In other words, he wanted to see them stop cheapening the grace of God. He told the church they needed to reject the authority of the Pope because they believe, believed and still believe that the Pope has full, supreme, and universal power over the whole church, a power which he can exercise unhindered. Meaning, regardless of what the Word says, they follow what the Pope says. The Catholic Church sees the Mass or the Eucharist as the source of, And I quote this, the source and summit of the Christian life to which the other sacraments are oriented. The Catholic Church believes that the Mass is exactly the same sacrifice that Jesus offered on the cross at Calvary. Exactly the same. So when you attend a Mass... They literally believe they are crucifying Jesus again. They are taught to believe that the bread is the literal body of Jesus. The blood, the wine is the literal blood of Jesus is what they're taught to believe. And they must participate in that crucifixion or they cannot be saved. 
But Hebrews 10, 8 and 10 says this. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that, will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Praise God. Once for all. So to continually crucify Jesus is to announce and declare that the once for all sacrifice of Jesus on the cross was insufficient. And I don't believe that for a second. Hebrews 4, 14 and 16. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Where do we draw near to? The throne of grace where Christ sits, not Mary. Not Mary. To pray to Mary is idolatry. It's absolute idolatry. But also, it is a shot at the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. To say that I'm going to pray to his mom because he'll listen to his mom. Is a shot at Christ and who he truly is. Satan had been choking the gospel for years. So God sent a messenger on the darkest night of the year, October 31st, and with a swing of a hammer, a cold nail driven into a wooden door, Martin Luther declared to the darkness that light was still alive. I don't think Martin Luther had any idea what that night would cause. In fact, I know, I know he didn't. But it sparked a revival. And this event partnered with the invention of the printing press that came at the same time. This Protestant movement began to take shape. Bibles were translated and printed. Massive evangelism began to take place. From this Reformation, a Latin statement emerged post tenebris lux, which means after darkness, light. There was a high cost for this revival, though. Many Protestants put to death at this time. William Tyndale, being one, put to death for translating the New Testament into English. You have your Bible because of William Tyndale, and most of you don't even know his name. Followed by John Rogers for his translation of the Old Testament. Men, women, and children tortured and killed, some for simply memorizing the Lord's Prayer in English. What these men, women, and children died for, we are in danger of forgetting. Many of these names we never hear mentioned anymore. Luther was known as a Protestant because he protested the teachings of the heretical Catholic Church. In fact, the Pope referred to him as a wild boar because he refused to fall in line with the teachings of the Catholic Church. So here we are today. Free Christian, right? 
And many of us don't even see where we're different. Well, I'm Protestant. And we use it as a historical word. I mean, it's not a historical word. That word is very, should be a very alive today in our lives. It's still a relevant term. Well, we're all Christians, aren't we? No, not even close. Absolutely not even close. Can someone in the Catholic Church be saved? Absolutely, 100%. Because you're not saved by belonging to a church. You're saved by believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do they believe we're saved? Absolutely not. We are anathema. We are to be put away. We're not the same. We're not the same at all. And our biggest difference is salvation. Our our biggest difference is how do we come into a reconciling relationship with Jesus Christ, which really puts to the forefront the biggest issue is we believe what the Bible says, they believe what tradition says. So no, we're not the same. So what the Reformation did for us was it brought to the forefront five key doctrinal positions upon which every Protestant should stand. Every Bible-believing Christian should stand, and I want to share them with you right now. Sola fide, by faith alone. Sola Scriptura, by Scripture alone. Solus Christos, through Christ alone. Sola Gratia, by grace alone. Sola De Gloria, to the glory of God alone. I could preach every five more Sundays on this, just right there. I didn't make that up. I wish I did, because that's incredible. It's just in the Bible. So really... The the Protestant movement, the Reformation, celebrates the glory of God. The calling of repentance of the church back to its first love, to the glory of God. John Calvin wrote, you touch upon the justification by faith, the first and keenest subject of the controversy between us. Wherever the knowledge of it is taken away, the glory of Christ is extinguished. So today we stand on the truth that there is free and sovereign grace from God and only from God. Through Christ and only through Christ, received by the Holy Spirit and only by the Holy Spirit. The achievement of the cross of Christ, providing peace with God for guilty sinners. Four times the book of Hebrews says, once and for all. And if it's once and for all, then there is absolutely no need for it to be reenacted or reproduced in a mass. We believe in the freedom of Scripture. God's word is for everyone. Everyone. Educated, uneducated, it doesn't matter. We believe in a personal relationship with God through his word. The Catholic Church believed and believes that God doesn't offer fellowship to be enjoyed through a personal encounter with him and his word, but only through the ministry of priests and sacraments. By that, it holds its parishioners hostage. John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me, the great high priest, Christ himself. So why should a Christian celebrate October 31st? Because we celebrate the Reformation, right? 
We celebrate the light exposing the darkness on the darkest night of the year. The day we began to protest and shall continue to protest any religion, any movement that does not place Christ in Scripture as its ultimate authority. The Reformation was a revolution. And revolutions not only fight for something, but they fight against something. Much like Jesus told his disciples that day at the base of Mount Hermon, attack the gates of hell. Attack the gates of hell. We must stand against anything that perverts the grace of God or cheapens the grace of God. We must protest any doctrine that denies one's rights to a personal relationship with God. We must protest anything that adds to or takes away from the sufficiency of Scripture. And how do we do that? We preach the Word of God. We live the Word of God. We lift high the Holy Scriptures in our own life by living exclusively Christ, the way, the truth, in the life. But I want you to know and understand that this isn't just an indictment upon the Catholic Church because many Protestant churches have fallen by this way. Much doctrine and theology that we hear today is heresy, absolute heresy. Heresy, and as uh, Dr. R.C. Sproul pointed out in that video today, we live in a time where a lot of people have a lot of opinions, but not a lot of people are reading their Bible. And so we fall for the traps. And they're not even good traps. They're, They're really just not even good traps. So Satan is running rampant in many even Protestant churches today. In many Protestant believers' lives. So take today as a call to repentance for the church, for our church, for your church. Christ has nailed a statement to the door of your heart. To those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent is the call. Here I am. Stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. 